Okay, not bad for Blumhouse, I have to say. Hey everyone, it's Don G. Corleone here, and I'm here with a brand new movie review, and this movie review is going to be for a horror film that has come out around the very first week of summer, as, um, around the end of June, and, um, it was a film that I think was supposed to come out earlier, but also got delayed a lot of times, and, um, it's a new horror film from Blumhouse, or as I call them, Bumhouse, because... You're going to find out why, but that film is none other than The Black Phone, based off the short story by, by I think, Stephen King's son. Yeah. So, before I get into details, what's the plot of this movie? Well, Finney Shaw is a shy but clever 13-year-old boy is abducted by a sadistic killer and trapped in a soundproof basement where, scream, where screaming is of no use. When a disconnected phone on the wall begins to ring, Finney discovers that he can hear the voices of the killer's previous victims. And they are dead set on making sure that what happened to them does not happen to Finney. So, yeah. How was the film made? Well, director Scott Derrickson and frequent collaborator C. Robert Cargill decided to adopt Joe Hill's short story, The Black Phone, into a, into a feature film while the former now working on the Doctor Strange sequel, or at the time, anyways, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Cargill promised to postpone the project until Derrickson had to commit with Marvel Studios became available for, to direct. In January 2020, Derrickson came on board to helm the Black Phone soon after departing from the Doctor Strange sequel due to creative differences. The Black Phone was announced in October around that time, with child actress Mason Thomas and Madeline McGross at the start. Thomas said his audition took place over Zoom soon after the COVID-19 pandemic happened, and it was quite weird for him, and they had bad Wi-Fi around that time, so he'd say a line, it would take a few seconds for them to say something back, and it would get a little awkward for that. And eventually, he would get a call back, though. In early 2021, Jeremy Davis, Ethan Hawke, and James Renson were added to the cast. Hawke said he was initially hesitant on playing the villain because he did not want to be remembered for a scary performance for the rest of his career. He changed his mind after realizing he was in his 50s. The villains might be, might, would be probably his future. And Pinsful Photography began on February 9th, 2021 and concluded on March 7th, 27, 2021. The movie took place at EOS and Screen Gems in Wellington, North Carolina, and around the Counties of New Hanover, Brunswick, and Columbus, and under the working title Static. Mark Hoven composed the score during post production, and the film was completed by December 2021. The movie would then have its world premiere at Fantastic Fest on September 25, 2021, but would not be released in the United States in the theaters until today, June 24, 2022, by Universal Pictures. The film has received generally positive reviews from critics, source performances, and faithfulness to the source material. Now, when I saw the trailer for this when I went to see Halloween Kills last year, I just shook my head at this because it just looked like a mess. Plus, I have never been a fan of most of Bumhouse's films. The only Blumhouse, or I call it Bumhouse, better name. I've only liked Split, The Purge, Anarchy, Get Out, and the 2018 Halloween movie and its sequel, Halloween Kills. We'll see about Halloween Ends when it comes out, but just have to see about that one. However, after I saw the positive attention it was receiving, I decided to go and give this movie a watch, and I gotta say, last night, for a Thursday night preview, I think this is my second favorite horror movie this year behind X. X is still the best horror movie this year, but this comes close second. The film does have some... does have some detractors, which I'll draw attention to later, but since I went to watch... But, 
It was still a pleasant surprise having Scott Derrickson return to the horror genre after having previously directed an entry in, entry in the never-ending Hellraiser series and one of the most overrated and dumbest horror films ever called Sinister. Yes, I hate Sinister, guys. Scott is kind of a mixed director to me. Like, he has directed some greats, such as 2016's Doctor Strange and this movie, but he has also directed some bad movies, such as 2008's Day of the Earth Stood Still, and sinister. There's kind of, but there is no real downside to Derrickson's directing here, as he gave his actors a lot of free reign, which performed largely due to the talent they possess. But the real strength is how he's able to merge what feels like an old school horror movie with a more modern and polished paranormal horror. This is probably what I think the movie does best. The first hour or so feels very much like an unintentional homage to the works of John Carpenter, everything from the late '70s suburban. Locale to the characters conversing through a tracking shot while walking down a sidewalk, and right down to the heart pounding synth in the opening track that kind of reminds me of a lot of Carpenter's music from Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. And Mark Hovind doesn't outstay his welcome with the sync of the score. It's heard when it needs to be, and vice versa. And then the latter half of the movie does feel a lot like Annie Mercedes' It Chapter 1, and it is because you have a bunch of Ron children attempting to take down a killer who does tend to favor balloons. And this is one of the movie's drawbacks, and it is sad one, sad because the unexplained paranormal elements of the film is the weakest elements. And, and from why the phone works to how the kids appear as phantasms are never really divulged to the audience, and it does subtract a tad from the dark and gritty story that was being told up until that point. And Ethan Hawke is a pretty excellent actor in this movie, and you can tell because he does so much with his eyes. The mask doesn't limit his acting ability in the slightest. If anything, he trends transcends it as it almost becomes a part of him and tells him how to feel, how to act and how, and you always know what you're going to get from the man behind the mask because he's already shown you without telling you. He's very terrifying in this film and that makes his performance great. He is every parent's worst nightmare. And I will always hesitate to cite a particular performance as a career best for an actor who is still active in the industry, but it must be said that this is the upper echelons in Hawk's great work. Or at least it's certainly up there with or I think this is probably his best performance so far because I've really seen a lot of his stuff, but so I'm gonna have to call this his best performance. Hawk exudes raw evil in his portrayal of the grabber. He sits traps to give himself an excuse to beat the boys. The lack of jump scares is more than compensated by this by very existence as a captor. There are quite a few scary scenes when the ghosts appear like zombies or just with blood dropping down cutthroats. If any time the seller seems to be one lock period of terror, even if it's an understood by his attempts to escape. The story is very complex and it gives a certain bit of emotional impact while remaining dire suspenseful stimulously, and while it does borrow slightly in certain aspects from other films, it still remains its own entity without cleverly plying, and unravels into something you will not see coming, which is always a welcome factor. And the visuals and settings are absolutely perfect and put and put you back in a different time entirely when this sort of crime is being committed with East throughout the country. That's another reason this film is so strikingly disturbing because 30 to 40 years ago, this was known to be a massive problem and a huge fear for so many parents, and the retro ambience is palpable. However, despite that, there are some bad qualities, I will admit. With the bad qualities, I do want to nitpick on two things at this movie and many movies both on a filmmaking level. One is this baseball scene that makes you question whether they even watch the sport with the way that the shots are composed. Another is that classroom trope where the bell rings as the teacher is teaching like they had 30 seconds to deliver a lesson and wonder where they needed to wrap up. Like, it's not these things in particular. And I know from the outside looking, people probably don't care, but there could be an intangible effect on these things when done right that just make for a more com competently made film overall. In the case of baseball and school scenes, there seems to be much less care about, much less care that occurs here, and aren't used to enhance the film either. They're just really dumb nitpicks to me. And I'd like to see films actually get these right because they never seem to. But I can live past those bad qualities. The black phone, I just really enjoyed, and so far a lot of people have been right about it. It's actually a pretty enjoyable film. And for a horror film to kick off the summer season, it's really something. I gotta say. And um, and now that I found another Blumhouse film that's actually good, 
can join the list of the only films I've liked from them. There, like, overall, like, I would rather watch something like this over crap like Paranormal Craptivity 500 gazillion. I wonder how many more sequels that's gonna get. Another freaking Purge movie. Only Purge movie I liked was Anarchy, and that was it. It's like, and like, even over the overrated movie Sinister, which apparently some scientists call the scariest movie ever. <laughs> Sin Guys, I hate Sinister. Sinister's so boring. Nothing scary even happens in that film. But overall, back to this. The Black Phone is just a very well-executed horror film bite with certain familiar cliches, a performance in Ethan Hawke alone that stands out phenomenally, and definitely a great time for a summer horror film. So yeah, this is definitely worth checking out in the theater for sure. But anyway, that's it for my review of The Black Phone. If you're wondering how I'm going to rank The Black Phone, here's how I'm going to rank this movie. So overall, if you are interested in starting your summer off with a horror film, then easily go and give this movie a watch and then buy it out to your collection for sure. And if you're wondering how I'm going to rank The Black Phone, I am going to give The Black Phone an 8 out of 10. There we go. That's pretty much it for my review of The Black Phone. This is not the only new release that comes out this weekend. This weekend also sees Elvis coming out, which I do want to see because... I am a fan of Elvis Presley's music, and and I think this actually looks pretty good. This, especially coming from the director that's been really mixed as well. But until then, guys, that'll be it for this review. Thank y'all for watching. If you like this and want to see more, and don't forget to like and subscribe to Don G. Corleone.